It was the first time Cecilia dared to ask for alms. She came shyly to a subway passage, put her shabby cap on the floor, and was standing there silently, lowering her eyes in shame. Passersby, seeing the young girl, rarely gave her money, but mostly criticized or lectured her. Aren't you ashamed? You are young, healthy, you have arms and legs. Go get a job. Lazy. This made Cecilia feel uncomfortable. She wanted to disappear in shame. No one knew why she was here, why she couldn't get a job, why she had no roof over her head. But everyone wanted to criticize her. And then, suddenly, three men ran up and started pushing her and shouting, Get out of here. Who the hell are you? All the places here are divided between us. Cecilia cried and covered herself with her hands. Don't touch me. Let me go. I'll leave now. Someone, please help me. The men took the money that was in the cab, then pushed Cecilia hard, spat after her, and went away, shouting one last time. We don't want to see you here again, understand, or you will regret it. As she fell, she hit the iron bars on the floor and cut her hand badly. She cried out from the intense pain and began to lose consciousness. Some of the kind-hearted passersby called an ambulance and the beggar was taken to the hospital, to the surgical department. There was a young doctor on shift, Eddie. He didn't like homeless people as much as anyone else. They usually had no ID, no money, and they smelled bad. No one wanted to treat the homeless, even to approach them. Therefore, when the nurse told him that the ambulance delivered a beggar with a deep cut on her arm, he grimaced and sighed, but went to help her. There was nothing he could do. He was obliged to save the life of any person. He said hello and examined the patient. The doctor expected to see a dirty alcoholic, but to his surprise, a young and pretty girl was sitting quietly in front of him. She had long blonde hair, and her huge gray eyes with long eyelashes were looking at him pleadingly. The patient's clothes were old but clean and not stinky. While the doctor was stitching up her wound, they talked. The doctor asked, What's your name? What happened? Why did you cut your hand so badly? The girl, grimacing in pain, answered, My name is Cecilia. Long story short, I have a tough life, and I was forced to beg for alms for the first time in my life. It turns out the place was already occupied by some thags. They kicked me out and made it clear that it would be bad for me if I ever showed up there again. When I fell, I had an iron bar, so I got hurt. I'm just unlucky. An old kind lady sheltered me temporarily, but I realized that I can't live off her forever. It's embarrassing, and I need to restore my ID. To do that I need money. It's such a vicious circle. The man looked at the patient and wondered why her face seemed familiar. The painfully familiar face, her smile, her voice, and then it hit him. Cecilia looked a lot like his late wife, Meredith. Wow, how is that possible? It was the reason why the surgeon immediately sympathized with her. He finished all the manipulations and said, Yes, it's a difficult situation, Cecilia. It's really critical. Your wound is quite deep. I put a drain. So you have to stay here for a few days. The nurse will take you to room number three. You don't have anything with you, right? I'll tell the nurse to give you a robe. The food here is not bad, so stay here, recover, get some rest, and then we'll figure out what to do with you. I'll check on you at the end of the day. The girl thanked the doctor sincerely and was glad she could stay at the hospital because now she had a roof over her head and food, at least for a couple of days. The wound was healing well, and Eddie checked on her regularly, asking about her condition. Even the nurses asked him in surprise. You are visiting the patient from the third room a lot, Eddie. Is she a relative or friend? The wound has already healed. The drain has been removed, and the girl is ready to be discharged from the hospital, but you're still delaying. The doctor replied in puzzlement, I feel sorry for her. She has nowhere to go, but she is obviously a good person. She won't survive on the street. Let her stay here for a couple more days, under my responsibility. That day, the surgeon's son became very ill. In the morning, he started sneezing and coughing. He had a fever. It was not safe to leave the child alone at home, and there was absolutely no one to babysit him. He had to do something urgently. He couldn't get a week off and couldn't figure out where he could find a good nanny for his son. The next day, Eddie came into Cecilia's room and suggested, Listen, Cecilia, I have a huge favor to ask of you. My son is ill. At first we thought it was just a cold, 
but it's been complicated by bronchitis. He has a fever and has to stay at home for three weeks. He is not a baby. He is nine years old, but still, I am afraid to leave him alone. He has to take a lot of pills. He needs treatment, and in general, he needs someone to take care of him. My son's name is Charlie. It's just the two of us. My wife died. She had kidney disease, and we have no other relatives. I wanted to take a sick leave myself, but then, unfortunately, two surgeons from our department were sent to another district. There was a serious accident there. You must have heard about it. There are a lot of injured people, so I have to handle everything here alone now. Could you babysit my son? Just for a while, until he's better. I'll pay you well. You can live at my place, and I guarantee you delicious dinner and hot shower daily. You said you need money, so will you help me? Cecilia hesitated. On the one hand, the offer was very good food, money, and a place to stay, but on the other hand, she was afraid that she would not be able to cope with it and would let down such a good man. So Cecilia didn't lie and answered, I really want to help you, but I'm not sure I can. I am not a professional nanny. I have never taken care of children. What if I do something wrong, or your son won't like me? Eddie smiled. You certainly don't have to worry about that. Charlie is a very calm, polite, and sociable boy, so he won't be a problem. I'll show you and tell you everything. I'm sure you'll be fine. If you help me, I won't have to worry about whether my son has eaten or taken his medicine. Cecilia agreed. She was discharged from the hospital and went with the surgeon to his home. At first, she was very timid and shy. She felt uncomfortable in the doctor's large mansion. The first thing Eddie did was to take her to meet his son. Cecilia looked at the skinny, blonde boy who was playing in the room. Seeing the guest, he was surprised and asked, Hello, Dad, do we have guests? She works at the hospital, too. The man smiled and touched the little boy's forehead. No, Charlie. This is Cecilia. She's going to be your babysitter until you get better. I'm very worried about you, and for good reason. You've got a fever again, and instead of staying in bed, you've been playing all day long. Did you take all your medicine? Why haven't you eaten anything again? Charlie, you and I have talked about this before. The boy lowered his eyes guiltily. I know, dead, but I have no appetite at all, and my throat hurts so bad it's painful to swallow, and staying in bed is boring. I'm glad Cecilia will be with me now. We're going to play, aren't we? Cecilia laughed and replied. Of course, we're going to treat you, so we don't upset daddy, and we're going to play. Listen, Charlie, I know a special recipe healing porridge that my grandmother used to make for me when I was sick. Do you want to try it? It'll help you to recover in no time, and your throat won't hurt so bad. You don't believe me. Let's try it. The boy got excited. I'm not sure. I actually don't like porridge. My dad's porridge is never tasty. But if it's healing, then okay, let's try it. I don't like to be sick. Cecilia went to the kitchen, asked the man where the kitchen utensils were, and began to work her magic at the stove. She made a berry vitamin drink and porridge with vanilla and raisins, decorated it nicely, and served it to the table. Eddie marveled at Cecilia's skill. Charlie was overjoyed, for the treats were colorful and unusual and he was surprised the porridge was really delicious. He ate a large bowl of porridge with gusto. Usually, Eddie didn't like porridge, but ate it too. For now, it was really tasty. Charlie said happily, this porridge is brilliant. This is the kind of porridge I like. It's great that you will stay at home with me now. At least I won't be bored. Daddy, I've taken my pills. Can I watch cartoons? Eddie replied, yes, you can watch, but not for too long. The man turned to the girl. Cecilia, you're amazing. Charlie refuses to eat so often, even when he's healthy, and now I can't persuade him to eat anything at all. Besides, I'm a terrible cook. To be honest, my son loves pizza and often asks for it, but I realize that the child needs normal food. I try to cook something healthy every week, but my son doesn't like my food very much, but he finished the meal that you made in a second. And it seems that you two have already made friends. I'm glad. Come on, I'll show you your room. The girl was happy that she had satisfied the child and found a common language with him. She began to get used to her new home. The room Eddie offered her turned out to be wonderful, spacious, full of light, with a balcony. There were various perfumes and makeup items on a small dressing table. 
Cecilia looked at everything curiously. The man said, This is my late wife Meredith's room. I couldn't change anything in here after she died. You will find clean linens and towels in the closet, and feel free to take any clothes. Everything is new, never used. Meredith loved shopping and always bought a lot of clothes ahead of time. Well, make yourself comfortable. The bathroom is down the hall on the left. Good night. Cecilia enjoyed the hot bath, washed her long blonde hair with expensive shampoo, wrapped herself in a warm terry cloth robe, and sighed blissfully, thinking to herself, very little is needed to make a happy life. The girl closed her eyes, but couldn't fall asleep and began to think about everything that had happened to her. These dark thoughts kept popping up in her mind over and over again, making her anxious. Cecilia grew up in a small town, living with her mother Marianne and grandmother Nancy. Her father died in an accident when she was only nine years old. Her mom had a very bad temper. It was very difficult to coexist with her. She was always fighting with her father when he was alive, and when he died, all the negativity turned to Cecilia. All the girl could hear was, How many times should I ask you? Don't turn around like an elephant. Don't make noise. I have a headache. Did you do your homework? Why are your grades in school so low? Why are you so stupid? Cecilia heard such phrases every day. She often argued with her mother and cried, but she didn't care about the tears of her only child. Sometimes it only made her even more angry. Why are you crying like a little girl? You better go wash the dishes. Your mother came home from work and the house looks like a mess. Therefore, the girl didn't really love her mother. She was even afraid of her. And if it were not for her dear grandmother, she would probably run away from home. Grandma Nancy loved her granddaughter, always felt compassion and encouraged her, saying, don't listen to anybody. You're a very smart and beautiful girl. Your mom is just very tired. It's hard for her to cope with everything alone. That's why she gets angry. But your mother loves you. She just doesn't know how to express her love. I know how hard you try. You are helping your mom and you're doing well in school. Everyone gets low scores in school sometimes, but you shouldn't get upset about it. Come to me, my sweet girl. Everything is okay. Calm down. Cecilia loved her grandmother and clung to her because only Nancy understood her inner world and supported her in everything. Nancy was a doctor when she was young. She also knew a lot about herbs and treated everyone she knew. It was never boring with her. The elderly woman often went to the woods with her granddaughter, taught her how to notice useful herbs under her feet, and told her what they could cure. The retired woman had once raised her daughter alone, and now she was raising her granddaughter. Once, when Cecilia was 10 years old, she and her friends went to the river to swim. Everyone knew that it was impossible to swim to the other side of the river. They said there was a deep maelstrom there, but the children were curious. They decided to check if it was true. So they started swimming to see who was faster. Cecilia tried to beat everyone. She was an excellent swimmer and was the first to reach the middle of the river. Suddenly, the maelstrom began to swirl her. She panicked, tried to swim out with all her strength, and shouted, Help me, I'm drowning. The water was cold and her leg cramped. Cecilia screamed in sharp pain and the water started pulling her under. The children were confused frightened and were afraid to go into the maelstrom after their friend. They only ran ashore and shouted, help, Cecilia is drowning, help. She was rescued by Andrew, a teenage boy from the neighborhood, five years older than Cecilia, who was fishing nearby. He was brave enough to dive under the water, even though he could drown. He managed to drag the girl to the shore and even brought her to her senses. Cecilia was in shock, coughing, crying and thanking her rescuer. Since that day, the kids became best friends. They loved to walk along that very river, chatting about all sorts of things, sharing their joys and sorrows. When they grew up, this faithful childhood friendship developed into the first innocent love. The guy courted Cecilia tenderly, gave her wild flowers, and never allowed himself anything superfluous. But her mother was against this relationship and scolded her daughter. Are you going to your Anne Rue again? You're only 16 and already going on dates. If you get pregnant, I will kick you out of the house. I'll lock you up and you won't go anywhere. It's too early to go out at night. You should think about your studies and help your mother. Cecilia sobbed and waited for her mother to fall asleep. 
and then she slipped away to spend at least an hour with her beloved. Her heart was waiting for these meetings. Her grandmother understood her better than anyone and often stood up for her granddaughter. And then an irreparable grief happened, grandmother died. She died quietly and painlessly, she fell asleep and never woke up again. Cecilia suffered a lot, often went to her grave, and out of habit shared all the news only with her dear grandmother. After the death of her grandmother, her mother became insane. There were constant quarrels in the house. And then Marianne suddenly decided to sell her house and move to the city to start a new life. Cecilia was against it. She didn't want to leave her hometown, where everything was so dear and familiar. And most importantly, she didn't want to part with Andrew. But her mother wouldn't listen. You are too young to tell me how to live. I'm sick of this life. Do you think it's easy to work on the farm day and night? And there's no future for you here. You can go to school in the city to become a sempstress. You're good at it. Don't cry. You'll thank me later. Cecilia sobbed. Mommy, please, let's not go anywhere. I love Andrew and I don't want to leave him. Don't you understand? I can't live without him. But her mother only said indifferently. It's just childish silliness. You'll meet a hundred more guys like Anru. I've made up my mind. In a week, we'll sell the house and go to the city. So, her mother took Cecilia to the city, almost by force, without even letting her say goodbye to her beloved. When they moved to the city, they rented an apartment on the outskirts. Her mother got a job in the kitchen, and Cecilia went to college to study sempstressing. But she didn't like life in the big city. Everything was wild and uncomfortable. And most importantly, the girl longed for her boyfriend and couldn't forget him. She often saw Anne ruin her dreams. He was looking at her and smiled, handing her wild flowers. After these dreams, the girl's pallor was always wet with tears, and her mood was ruined. Three years passed quickly. Cecilia almost finished her studies, but her mother was getting worse, and her health was failing. She was dying before her eyes. She lost a lot of weight and looked weak, and she had no appetite but she refused to go to the hospital until the last minute. She was sure it was due to lack of sleep and exhaustion at work. And when Cecilia finally persuaded her to go to the doctor, the verdict was shocking. They didn't even offer her any treatment, saying she didn't have much time left to live. The news shocked Cecilia. Her mother died three months later, so the girl became an orphan. Just before she died, her mom finally said those very important words. Forgive me that I was always so tough with you, that I didn't give you enough affection. It's just that I've always had a bad temper. But remember, I've always loved you. I lived only for you. I tried so hard. I thought that we would be lucky in the city, that we would start a new life. But I guess fate had other plans. Cecilia cried, kissed her mother's weak hands, and whispered, I love you too, mommy. Don't go away. Don't leave me, please. How will I live without you? I'm so scared. And her mother said to her, Don't cry, my dear. Find a decent husband. I've been single my whole life and it's been too hard for me. Find a good husband and you will always have support. Cecilia had no idea what to do or how to move on after her mother's death. Her mother's savings had been spent on the funeral and memorial services and were fading before her eyes. In despair, Cecilia remembered her mother's advice and married literally the first man she met. She met Lucas by chance on the street. He gave her a ride to college and introduced himself as an entrepreneur. He pretended to be rich and successful and promised her a beautiful life. That's why Cecilia thought it was the way out of the situation. Her husband would provide for her and he had his own apartment. They got married and only when they began to live together did the girl realize what a nightmare she got into. It turned out that Lucas was not an entrepreneur. He gambled all the time didn't have a job, and often went somewhere at night. The quarrels began in the family. Cecilia cried and asked him to stop, to find a job and live a normal life. She wanted a quite happy life, to have kids. They lived together for only six months, and then Lucas lost all the money and ran away to avoid going to jail. The apartment was taken away by criminals for debts. They came and kicked Cecilia out. They didn't even let her pack her belongings and papers. They threatened that if she ever came to the apartment again, she would be in trouble. That's how Cecilia ended up homeless. She wandered around the streets and cried, and slept in basements and subways. She was starving, and fear was gripping her whole body. 
Will she live like this forever? What awaits her? Only poverty. The elderly lady, who worked as a janitor, was very compassionate and took her in, even though she was very poor. The girl was ashamed to live at her expense, so she decided to try begging, but it all ended very sadly. Even now, being in the surgeon's comfortable house, being safe, Cecilia was worried. I'll stay here for a while, help the doctor, earn some money, but then what? Back on the street. I wish I could restore my ID. The very next day Cecilia began her babysitting duties. She and Charlie had a lot of fun together, but she didn't forget that Charlie still had severe bronchitis, so she treated him. In addition to what the doctor prescribed, she remembered her grandmother's recipes and made herbal potions. The boy gradually recovered. They did everything together, cooked dinner for dad, cleaned the house, and then played chess and bingo. The days passed quickly. Eddie was totally immersed in his work, coming home from work very late, but he was happy to have Cecilia living with them. He had delicious dinners, saw that his son was doing much better, and never stopped thanking the girl. Thank you, Cecilia. You are my savior. I don't know what I would do without your help. I can work in peace and be sure that everything is fine at home. If I could, I would never let you go anywhere. One day Cecilia and Charlie were in the kitchen making dumplings and talking about all sorts of things. The little boy was doing his best. He clearly liked cooking. Cecilia didn't care that the boy's dumplings were big and not very accurate. On the contrary, she praised him. Great job. Daddy will be happy that his son made dinner for him. You know, your dad is wonderful. He saves people and loves you very much. The boy philosophically replied, Yes, Daddy is great. I know, and I love him too. Do you want me to tell you a secret? He's not my real dad. Cecilia was surprised. What do you mean? Not your real dad. Charlie, don't make up this nonsense. How can you say that? The boy continued. I'm not making it up and I'm not lying. He's my uncle, and my real parents died when I was a baby. I'm often home alone, so I found the papers by chance. There's my parents' death certificate and my adoption certificate. At first, I was upset that my mom and dad were dead, but then I realized that I could have ended up in an orphanage. So I was happy that Eddie's my dad now. He's really cool. Just don't tell him, or he'll be upset that I rummaged in his desk without asking. Cecilia was shocked by what she heard and promised not to say anything, but she felt even more respect for the surgeon, who had adopted his nephew and was raising him as his own son. Not every man could do such a thing. A couple of weeks later, Eddie asked Cecilia, Today is a very special day for me, but a very sad one. It's the day my brother, Andrew, died in a car accident. I always visit his grave. It makes me feel better. Cecilia, let's honor him. May he rest in peace. And his wife, Lily, too. Such a ridiculous death. They were so young, with their whole lives ahead of them. Cecilia couldn't resist asking. Tell me about him. What was he like? He grew up together, didn't you? The surgeon sighed and began to say, Yes, the story of our family wasn't happy. My parents didn't stay together long. My mom gave birth to my brother and me and then she and my dad divorced a year later. My brother and I are twins, but we don't look alike at all, and so our parents couldn't think of anything better to do than to separate the children. My dad went to live in the little remote town and took Andrew with him. My mom stayed in the city and raised me. That's how we were separated when we were kids. My parents never forgave each other for everything that happened between them. But my brother and I, when we became adults and had our own families, we began to communicate much more. And then misfortunes began to happen one after another. First, my wife died. I was so depressed. I thought I would go crazy from the sadness, which tore my soul apart. Andrew supported me a lot. I was very grateful to him. I stayed at their house more often than I did at home. Then their son was born. I was just beginning to recover. The baby was a year old. And then another disaster happened. My brother and his wife died in a terrible accident, and their son was left an orphan, and there was pain, grief, and longing again. I thought I wouldn't cope with everything. Of course, I couldn't let the child end up in an orphanage, so I adopted him. So Charlie is my foster son. But believe me, I love him like he's my own child. Just don't tell him. The boy doesn't know about that. He thinks he is my biological son.
Cecilia chuckled. You're a bad conspirator, Eddie. Charlie knows everything. He found the papers a long time ago and read them all, but he didn't want to upset you and kept quiet. The surgeon was greatly surprised. What? I can't believe it. He never said a word. He's incredibly wise for his age. Well, maybe it's better that way. I'd have had to tell him sometime anyway. Cecilia asked. Can I see a picture of your brother? I'm wondering if Charlie looks like him. The surgeon replied. Sure, I'll get the album now. Eddie opened the album and began to show the photo. Here, these are my parents. Young and happy. I can't even believe they are gone. And this is Enru and his wife, Lily. As you can see, we don't look alike at all, even though we're twins. And this is him as a child. The only picture I have left. He's so funny skinny and tall. Cecilia took a closer look and shrieked. No way. Andrew, he's from my hometown. What a twist of fate. I know your brother very well. He saved my life when I was a kid. Pulled me out of the river. Then we became friends and later we even fell in love. He gave me such beautiful wildflowers and looked at me with eyes full of love. But my mother decided to sell the house and took me away almost by force. She didn't even let me say goodbye. I cried so much. I missed him so much. So, he is no longer alive. Cecilia's eyes darkened. Tears came to rise and the memories came back. Eddie asked cautiously. Wow, you and I met at the hospital by chance. Was it really by chance? I mean, you were in love with my brother. I just can't believe it. What happened next? Tell me a little about yourself. How did you end up on the street? You haven't told me anything about yourself, and I don't want to ask you too many questions. But since tonight's the night for memories and revelations, why don't you share? Don't you have any relatives at all? Cecilia sighed. Well, there's not much to tell. My life has always been nothing but misery. I went to college and graduated. Then my mom passed away. She had a severe illness. We often quarreled. We were too different, and we had different goals and different dreams. But still, at least there was someone close to me. And after the funeral, things got really bad. I couldn't pay the rent. Nobody wanted to hire me without work experience. So I got married in a hurry, literally to the first man I met. But as they say, if there's no love, there's no happiness. Lucas turned out to be a gambler, lost everything, and ran away to avoid going to jail. I was kicked out of the apartment by his enemies, who didn't even let me pack my belongings or at least take my ID from the apartment. That's how I ended up a beggar. I wandered the streets. I was so scared, hopeless. An old woman helped me, took me in, and then I came to your hospital. That's the whole story. So, Eddie, thank you so much for sheltering me and giving me a job. I've almost got my papers restored. I'm going to get them in three days. So I'll leave soon, and I won't bother you and your son anymore. The man timidly took Cecilia's hand and said, You know what, Cecilia, don't leave, stay with us. Charlie likes you, I can see that, and when you're at home, I don't have to worry about him. I know that everything is fine. Besides, as it turns out, we're not even strangers to each other. You love my brother, and he loved you too. You were a part of his life. It means a lot to me. I feel like I'm responsible for you. I'll take care of you. No objections. After my wife died, it's like something died inside of me too. Only my nephew kept me alive. And when I saw you for the first time, I couldn't figure out who you looked like. Here, take a look at this photo. Do you notice the resemblance? You and Meredith have the same eyes, the same hair, the same overall look. That's probably why I liked you right away. I feel some warmth towards you as if you are not a stranger to me. Cecilia was sincerely grateful to the surgeon. To the point of tears, she murmured, Thank you, Eddie. I'll happily accept your offer. I really don't have anywhere else to go. I don't even want to live when I think of going to the subway again. Your place is warm and cozy, and Charlie and I are already best friends. Can I ask you one more thing? I hope you don't find this impertinent. I'd really like to work. I've been good at sewing since I was a kid, and I learned a lot of things in college. I could work from home and take orders. I'd really like to try. I saw a sewing machine in your closet. Can I use it? Eddie laughed. Why do you even ask? Take whatever you need. There's not only a sewing machine in there. There's also fabric, needles, and everything you need to sew. My mother sewed well. She loved it. It's her sewing machine. 
so you can use it. I'll ask at work. Maybe someone needs to sue something. Also, you can advertise on the internet. Charlie can help you with that. I'll be glad if you will do something you like. Thus Cecilia stayed with Eddie's family. Gradually, the couple became so close that they started a romance. It all happened so spontaneously. Cecilia was washing dishes late at night, when Eddie suddenly approached her quietly from behind and hugged her, began to kiss her neck, and whispered, Cecilia, sweetheart, I feel so good and peaceful when you're home, by my side, you know, I love you, be my wife, after all, we already live almost like a family. At that moment, everything exploded inside Cecilia, and an avalanche of tenderness and passion literally burst out. She'd been waiting for those words dreaming of them, but she'd been holding back her feelings, wanting Eddie to make the first step. She put her arms around his neck, and they kissed so passionately that it seemed they were floating above the ground. Cecilia and Eddie had a modest wedding the surgeon had invited only a few friends. Charlie accepted the news with joy. He got used to Cecilia long ago, and without noticing it, he began to call her mom more and more often. The boy helped her to post an ad about sewing clothes at home on all social networks, and soon the first customers texted her. The woman quickly mastered the sewing business and got not only pleasure from work, but also a good profit. Life began to get better, and Cecilia finally felt truly happy. One chilly evening, the woman was returning home from shopping and saw an old man freezing on a cold bench. He was shaking from the cold, wearing only an old thin jacket clearly out of season, in a ridiculous hat. He was shaking his palms, trying to warm them a little. Cecilia felt so sorry for the poor man she immediately thought of her own experience of being homeless. She approached the old man and asked him kindly, Good evening, pardon me for bothering you, but it's so cold outside, and your clothes are out of season. Why are you here? Maybe you need some help. The old man raised his head and barely moving his lips replied, I have nowhere to go. Dear, I don't know who I am or where I come from. Everything clenched inside the woman. She didn't ask the stranger any questions and just held out her hand to him. Get up, come with me, you need to warm up urgently. Otherwise, you can end up with frostbite. Come on, let's go, it's not far. The old man looked at her with so much gratitude and followed, saying, Thank you for your kind heart. I'm really cold. I can't feel my feet anymore. Don't worry, I'll get warm and then leave. I won't bother you. Cecilia entered the house, and Charlie ran out to meet her in the hall. Seeing the guest, he exclaimed, Hello, Mom. You're not alone. Who is it? Cecilia replied quietly, Hello, dear. No, it's just a passerby. He's very cold. Take the bags and make some tea. We need to warm up our guest urgently. By the way, my name is Cecilia. My husband, Eddie, will be home soon. And this is our son, Charlie. What's your name? Why don't you take off your clothes and sit down in the chair? I'll bring you a warm blanket and some tea and honey. The old man answered timidly. Nice to meet you. My name is Jonathan, I guess, but I'm not sure about that. The woman was greatly surprised. What do you mean? You're not sure. You don't remember your name. I can't believe that. The man said. I don't understand anything myself. It's like emptiness in my head as if everything had been erased from my memory. Three months ago, workers from the construction site found me in a ditch, unconscious. I had a huge wound on my head. They asked me who I was and where I was from, but I didn't remember anything, so they started calling me Jonathan. They gave me some clothes and fed me. I had no money, no papers. I'm wandering the streets like a stranger, hoping to remember something. Cecilia only shook her head. Jonathan wasn't lying. She could see it in his eyes. There was such longing in them. The woman pulled a clean towel and bathrobe from the closet and handed it to the man. I will not let you go back to the freezing streets. Here, take it and go take a hot shower. I'll show you everything now. Meanwhile, I'll make dinner and prepare a room for you. You can stay with us for a while. Jonathan almost cried with happiness. Thank you, Cecilia, but I don't want to bother you. What if your husband doesn't like it? After all, you don't know me at all. I'm just a stranger, but you let me in. I feel so embarrassed. The woman comforted her guest. Eddie will definitely understand and won't mind. It's hard to believe, but I used to live on the streets too. Eddie sheltered me, and then we fell in love and got married. He has a good heart. I understand you very well. 
better than anyone else. I was helpless and miserable too, except I didn't lose my memory. Good people with a kind heart helped me. So, I just want to help you too. And don't worry you don't tell me anything in return. Okay, I'm going to the kitchen. I'll wait for you there. While the guest was taking a shower, Eddie came home from work. Cecilia briefly explained the situation to him and asked anxiously, I'm sorry I took Jonathan home without asking you. Are you mad? It's just that I felt so sorry for him. He could have frozen to death. The man put his arm around his wife and pulled her gently against him. I'm not mad and I don't mind if someone is in trouble. We should always try to help them. The elderly man came out of the bathroom and Cecilia was shocked. Now he didn't look like a homeless man at all. A well-looking gray-haired man with huge set eyes stood before her. He looked more like a scientist or a lawyer than a homeless man. The woman introduced the guest to her husband. Everyone sat down at the table to have dinner. At first, Jonathan was a little shy and timid, but Charlie was talking non-stop, telling him about his crafts and hobbies, and Jonathan calmed down and relaxed. Eddie, hearing Jonathan's story, immediately offered his help. You know what, nowadays, there are many different techniques to bring back a person's memory. If you want, I'll take you to an expert tomorrow. We'll try hypnosis and medication. What if it helps? The sooner we start treatment, the better the chances of success. Jonathan was overjoyed. Thank you, Eddie. I agree to all kinds of treatments. I want to find out who I am. Maybe I have relatives. I'm just wandering around like a ghost, and there's nothing but a void inside me. When I look around, I don't recognize anyone or anything. It's so scary. Charlie exclaimed excitedly. Grandpa Jonathan, you are going to live with us now. That's great. Do you know how to make airplanes or ships out of wood? I have a wood carving kit, but my dad doesn't have time to teach me how to do it. Tears came to Jonathan's eyes. He was so grateful that he was so warmly welcomed by this family, like he was not a stranger, like it was his own family. And he said, sure. Kiddo, I have plenty of time. We make the best wooden ship, I promise. The next day, Eddie took Jonathan to a therapist, as promised, and the therapist agreed to treat him. He prescribed medication and hypnosis sessions, and the miracle happened. A month later, the old man remembered everything, but what happened to him shocked everyone. It turned out that the man's name was not Jonathan, but Lyle. He was not a retiree, but a well-known businessman. He owned a network of grocery stores in the city, and his stepson, Vincent, wanted to get rid of him and get his business. In fact, relations between them have always been tense, and Lionel didn't want to let this greedy and dishonest man enter his business and was preparing this position for his own son from his first marriage, Dennis. The boys were the same age and both studied at the University of Economics, but only Dennis really loved his father, worried about him and tried to help him in everything. And Vincent only skipped classes, had fun, and then paid bribes to the tutors to pass the exams. His mother, Lyle's second wife, tolerated her son's behavior and hated Dennis, who was too smart and decent. So they decided to get rid of the head of the family. First, they should kill Lyle and then figure out what to do with his son. That day, the businessman was on his way home after an important meeting, but his car broke down suddenly. Lionel decided to take it to the car service for repair. He decided not to take a cab and to walk home on foot, as it was not too far away. And then, someone attacked the businessman, hitting him on the head with something heavy. Falling down, Lionel looked back and recognized his stepson. The guy was grinning, and he didn't even hide his face. Then there was another blow on the head, and then total darkness. When the elderly man remembered everything and listened to the tape the doctor had given him, he immediately decided to go to the police. The police found out that Lionel's biological son was looking for him. They started an investigation and even managed to find the construction workers who had rescued the businessman and pulled him out of the ditch. His wife and stepson were imprisoned, and the father finally met his son. Dennis cried and hugged his precious father. Lionel was also incredibly happy. Lionel told him the whole story and also introduced him to his saviors. Eddie and Cecilia. Eddie suggested, I think it would be good for your father to go to the hospital and get her full checkup. Dennis supported the idea and persuaded his father to have a checkup, so he went to a paid luxury room. Eddie began his treatment. 
He was just going through all the patient's laboratory tests, and suddenly he saw something that made his glasses almost fall off. Lyle had a very rare blood type and phenotype, but it was exactly the same as Eddie had. It was an incredible coincidence. It only happened to close relatives. The surgeon got up and immediately rushed to the businessman's room and began to explain everything to him. Lionel, your test results are ready. You won't believe it, but you and I have the same phenotype and blood type. I'm not just surprised, I'm puzzled because it can be possible only if we are blood relatives. But how is that possible? My mom raised me. Her name was Ave. Though that name mean anything to you? Maybe you knew her. The businessman suddenly perked up. What did you say? Evie, did she happen to study at the pedagogical university by any chance? The surgeon nodded. Yes, she did. She graduated from it and worked as a teacher for the rest of her life. So you knew my mom? Yes, I knew your mom. She and I had a short-term romance. I remember her. She was a very beautiful girl, but with a bad temper. We were very close. We had deep feelings, but somehow it didn't work out. Do you think I could be your father? Dennis answered resolutely. I suggest to make a test and check out all our conjectures. Three days later, the test results were ready, and it shocked everyone. Eddie and Lionel turned out to be biological father and son. It was a one in a million chance. After being discharged from the hospital, the whole family reunited at Eddie's mansion around a big table. Dennis was overjoyed to hear that he had such a wonderful brother. He and Eddie immediately bonded and developed a warm, friendly relationship. The brothers spent the evening sharing their childhood memories and talking about life. Charlie wouldn't leave his grandfather's side, and they discussed how they would go fishing on weekends. Cecilia was genuinely happy that her husband had unexpectedly found a big family. The woman watched them all talking and mentally thanked God that he had given her such happiness, to be a wife, to be loved, and most importantly, to be a mother. She considered Charlie her son, and she and Eddie even thought about having a baby together. After all, even Charlie had asked for a brother or sister many times. After she met Eddie, Cecilia's life was divided into before and after. It seemed to her that grief, death, poverty, betrayal, and all the horrors she had experienced had remained in her past life. There was only a happy future ahead because no matter what happened, a faithful and reliable man, her beloved Eddie, was always by her side. He will always support her and help her. Eddie also thought about how unpredictable and amazing life is. But life is very simple, you just need to do good to people, and it will definitely come back to you.